I am super excited today to bring back one of my favorite guests to the show, Rob Wolf. And boy, do we get after it in this one. We chat a lot in the beginning about sort of the trends of paleo and keto, carnivore, et cetera, that have come and gone. And Rob's played an integral role in all of those spaces. He's been doing phenomenal work for the last 10 plus years, but we've been thinking about sort of like what's next. And that prompted a lot of deep dives into some areas of the world that are not as bright as they used to be 10 years ago when Rob started his work. So this is a sensitive topic a lot of the times around cancel culture and how that makes our job much, much more difficult when we try to talk about facts and the world does not want to take them. So this one might cause some fires and have some people run after us with pitchforks, but I'd say that we're used to that already. Um, most importantly, I just want to open up the conversation to the problem with discarding facts and truths, especially when you're in the space of trying to help people get healthier. This is how we move forward. This is how we understand the human body, why people are sick and how to help them be healthy. Cause that's, that's what it's all about. That's why we're here. That's why Rob and I do the work that we do. So it was something that's obviously been on both of our minds for a long time. And it was definitely a tangent that weren't, we weren't expecting, but it's something that I think is super powerful and worth putting out there. So I hope you guys enjoy and think about just treating people who have different opinions than you with respect. So enjoy this podcast and take some notes. This episode is brought to you by Element or LMNT, which is an electrolyte beverage brand founded by Rob Wolf, Luis Villasenor, and Tyler Cartwright. Two of three of those guys have actually been on the show to talk about why they started this company and their background in this space. But mainly they have worked with literally thousands of people. And these are some of the most qualified experts that I learned a lot from in the early days of when I was doing keto and helping research and help a lot of people. And the number one thing that these guys saw was that people were having an extremely hard time switching to low carb because they were simply not getting enough electrolytes. But as you guys know, I often complain about the supplement industry is full of absolute trash that people using artificial ingredients, fillers, sugar, et cetera, and they could not find an electrolyte that met their standards, not only from lack of ingredients, but not having the highest amount of sodium, potassium, and magnesium that they thought needed to exist in certain ratios. So they launched Element and I drink them myself daily. So I've been a long time user basically since the first day they launched. And whenever I go back to eating keto or lower carb after eating moderate moderate carbs, I need these things um, like at least a couple times a day or else I feel like crap, especially in the summertime here in Austin, Texas, where it's uh, you know 150 degrees every single day. And I'm you know working outside, playing basketball, hanging out with friends. And sweating my face off, I, I typically have up to four of these in a day. My favorite is the citrus salt, which is the original one, but the raspberry and habanero are also my favorites as well. So if you guys want to hear more about Element and my favorites and why I use it, head on over to drinklmnt.com slash T-N-S-P. That's drinklmnt.com slash T-N-S-P. This episode is brought to you by Bel Campo. Bel Campo is one of my favorite regenerative outfits on the entire planet, led by CEO Anya Fernald, who has actually been on this podcast to talk about why she started this forum. But one of my favorite things about Bel Campo is that they're doing things at a massive scale. So while a lot of regenerative farms are really great in doing a lot of good work, there are maybe a couple hundred acres, a couple thousand acres. And while we need many, many of those, we also need to set a huge example at scale for conventional growers and farmers and ranchers, because that's the only way we're going to get people to switch over. If we can share that we can do a, a massively impactful regenerative model where it's not only certified humane and the best for the animals, but also sustainable and puts carbon back into the soil and regenerates our farm and ranch land. This is the most important thing. So I love what they're doing. Asked Anya for a while if they would come on and support the show. And lucky enough, here we are. And they have amazing meat products. I love all their stuff, their fresh meat. But what I really love too is that they take a lot of their stuff and make, you know, they just launch ready to eat meatballs, for example. They have beef sticks, jerky, bone broth. They have a whole suite of other things that you can get to sort of supplement and use all the animal. So a lot of these brands, you know, White Oak's a good example. They use a lot of the animal as well, but Bell Campo is doing it at such a scale that they can just do things at different prices and really make it affordable comparatively to a lot of other brands. So 
I love Bel Campo. Uh, if you want to try them out, just head to belcampo.com slash D-R-G-U-S-T-I-N for 20% off for first-time customers. That's B-E-L-C-A-M-P-O dot com slash D-R-G-U-S-T-I-N for 20% off for first-time customers. And I hope you guys enjoy. It's an amazing brand with an amazing founder. Incredible story. Again, go check out that podcast with Anya if you guys are curious more about Bel Campo. Rob, thank you for joining me today. Hey, Doc, huge honor to be here. Thank you. So one of the things I wanted to jump into real quick is that, you know, we've been doing a lot with the keto stuff, obviously, the last couple of years. You guys have been doing tremendous amount of work in that space, but I don't know how you're feeling about it, but to me, it's sort of, I get the sense that we're like how paleo was five, six years ago. There's not much new coming out. We sort of understand the framework of it. We go, okay, this is a really excellent framework of how to eat nutri- eat food, et cetera, and keto is now this great tool. How are you thinking about, you know, state of keto and what else there is to learn about it? That's a really interesting question. You know, uh, unlike paleo, you know, clearly I'm a huge fan of the ancestral health, you know, framework and uh, funny enough was always kind of the, the keto guy promoting paleo um, because of kind of what the, uh, definitely the immunogenic food side of things was really important gut gut issues and, and whatnot, and kind of the broader ancestral health kind of, kind of perspective with photo period and circadian rhythm and everything. But the ketogenic diet is really slick in that it does have kind of a binary on off. Yes. No kind of set point, you know, are you in ketosis or not? And if we all kind of agree that, you know, this 0.5 millimolar of, of beta hydroxybutyrate is kind of in versus out, um, that really does lend itself well to research. So I do think that the research side of this story is going to go much deeper, much broader than what we saw with the paleo diet. Uh, Linda Frasetto at UCSF did some amazing paleo diet research. Like she did some really cool stuff where, where folks were, um, their metabolic health was assessed independent of weight loss. So these people were basically like force fed. They had to beg these folks to eat enough of a paleo diet template to not lose weight. And it was very hard to do because it's a highly satiating way to eat as is kind of a whole food keto type approach, probably arguably even more so. But what was fascinating about that is that there were significant improvements in metabolic health from a food quality perspective, independent of weight loss. And most of the kind of evidence-based nutrition folks would say that that can't happen, that the totality of metabolic benefit is from calorie restriction and weight loss and whatnot. And clearly there is benefit to that, but there's this other piece of the the food quality that, that really does matter. And there was just a, a paper that I became aware of yesterday talking about how 20% of people end up experiencing some sort of a gut related immuno- immunological reaction to the food they eat that mainly manifests in, in gut pain. And I think it may be even more than that, but you know, this, this is, um, I think that although we're, you know, I think for folks like you and I that have been in this space a long time, it can feel kind of long in the tooth, but I, I was, I, I took my girls to a, uh, kind of a local ice cream shop the other day. And I, I was talking to the owners and I was like, Hey, when you guys develop a, a keto, it, they make all the stuff there. I'm like, Hey, when you, I, I was just kind of joking around, but I said, when you guys make a keto ice cream, like I'll, I'll be all over that. And they're like, next week we've got one. Like we've been working on it. And, and, uh, both of these folks are, are immigrants from Argentina and the wife is like, I lost 45 pounds doing keto last year. And, 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 and uh, I forget whose book that, that she had followed, but I mean, she looks amazing. She looks absolutely amazing. It's kind of funny. They're, they're kind of like, yeah, like we feel wonderful on keto, but now we're selling ice cream and, you know, we're going to try to develop some keto options here, you know, to promote this healthier kind of side of this. So think that it's, it's, uh, you know, what's that early, you know, like you've got the early adopter, the later adopter, and then when it, you know, 15% of the population becomes aware of it, then it can start kind of drifting into the, the mainstream. Um, I don't even think that keto has really made it to the mainstream yet. You know, people are kind of peripherally aware of it, but I mean, uh, uh, just folks developing products that allow you a much broader experience than like bacon and eggs and broccoli, you, you know, it, uh, I think that we may be, um, literally in the, you know, like the, 
the cover and, and, um, uh, you know, like the, the, the beginning chapters of something that's going to be a very long book about this whole story. So I don't know that the, you know, the time is done on it. I think we may literally just be getting going. Um, and, and just, and I know I'm kind of bouncing all over the place, but in this age of COVID where from almost day one, we knew that better metabolic health, better glycemic control, um, uh, tighter bounds on our insulin management, are better for, for all health outcomes, like whether or not you are hospitalized, whether or not you're sick, whether or not the individual develops long haul syndrome. We had su very suggestive information around that last March. And now as we're coming up on, on a year here, that information has only gotten deeper and better. And although I'm optimistic about vaccines and a, and a whole host of things, it could be that, that COVID is just with us like influenza. Mm -hmm. And some of the projections that I've seen is that it could become the third leading killer of, a, of, you know, Americans of westernized populations here because the, the vaccines may not be as efficacious as, as what some might hope. And really, literally the only tool then that we have, unless we just want to absolutely nuke our, our economic infrastructure and, and, you know, destroy it in a way that it, it may never come back or it take decades to come back. The only other lever we have is metabolic health and, and ketogenic diets, even potentially supplementing with um, ketone salts, ketone esters could be this amazing therapeutic intervention that uh, uh, could really make a remarkable change in how infectious disease, specifically the SARS-CoV-2 virus could be handled. So I don't know, I'm pretty optimistic about where this goes as a, I guess, like a metabolic therapeutic and also just making its way into the, the kind of collective consciousness um, of everybody. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's certainly not going anywhere. Just like, I don't think ancestral health, eating real food, paleo is going anywhere. And I think that after you get to sort of like the 80, 20, where 80% of the, like, here's how you do it. There are, you know, 10 books about it. At that point, I think that the sort of fringe health community gets a little bored of topics. Right. Like right. I don't think research is going to continue uh, and that it should, it certainly should. I mean, even promise around, you know, if you're an NFL fan or watching the NFL playoffs, but P Patrick Mahomes has this just gnarly concussion. And like mm -hmm. he lit up and his face looking at it, it was just all woozy. Like he had had, you know, 15 shots of tequila. And this is another area where like traumatic brain injury, concussion yeah. and ketones, like this needs to be studied. If, if this can be on the sidelines of, of, of sports games and people are going to be sipping on that instead of Gatorade, we can be preventing and minimizing a lot of these, these symptoms out like post TBI. We for sure need to be looking into that, but more so like I'm talking about the the crazy health geeks who are at the, the edge of things who, you know, I mean, yep. you, you saw a lot of people shift from paleo to keto and I'm, I'm just trying to understand like what's going to be that next thing. Like carnivore, I think is a little too extreme to, to take it over. Um, I think that at least what I hope is that a little bit more clarity around fatty acids and mm -hmm. quality. And so like bringing it back the other way, I think it gave the keto trend gave excuse to a lot of people to go back to the, Oh, fuck it. It doesn't matter what, what quality of food you eat. As long as it hits your macros, totally fine. Right. Like you're saying, there, there's way more nuance to it. And like a lot of the people that I've worked with have seen so much benefit after they go to a ketogenic diet and we say, okay, doing well, things are going well. Now let's remove linoleic acid uh, mm -hmm. almost completely from your diet and replace it with saturated fatty acids. And then it's like they hit this whole new level, which is completely coincides with food quality. Again, like if you're eating right. high linoleic acid, you're just eating food that shouldn't exist in nature in the first place. Right. So yeah, right. Curious as far as like, if you have any inkling of where this is going to go next. So, so, you know, we, uh, I remember at the first paleo FX, uh, they, they had this session that they've kept through all of them. It was basically the, uh, the future of paleo, you know, where do you see different things going and gosh, this was 2010 or 11. I, I forget when the first one was, it was a long time ago now, but question was, where do you see the paleo diet going? And I said, somebody's going to take the paleo template. They're going to draw some completely arbitrary lane lines within it. You know, this is in, that's out, uh, not really defensible by science, but it's something so that, so that minimizes kind of the, the, uh, the noise that people experience going in. Um, they're going to provide a name to it that is IP defensible and brandable. And they're going to ride into the sunset. And that was whole 30. You know, there's, it's basically a paleo, paleo diet. 
the lane lines that they have are, are good, but they're completely arbitrary. Like one of the biggest challenges with it is that once people kind of motor through it, they start asking a lot of questions like, well, why is this in and that's out? And it, it, it's because there's a ton of individual variation and nuance, but it is a way to, to move people through. And I guess it'll, it, you know, potentially we might see something like, you know, Atkins, South Beach. Like I, I could actually see, um, somebody pretty popular trying to breathe some life back into like a cyclic ketogenic diet. Um, everybody's always trying to sell people on the ability to have it all. So maybe like a, a five days keto to, you know, two days, not keto or one cheap meal within the, you know, the context, I could see something like that. And again, it'll be kind of arbitrary lane lines. It'll have enough of a kernel of the operating system of a, a keto or, you know, whole food ancestral type diet that it should work pretty well. Um, they'll have a few proprietary tweaks and fiddles that makes them different and they can kind of distinguish themselves from everybody else. And they'll have hopefully kind of a snazzy name and a, a defensible intellectual property so that, you know, this is us, this is the boundary of what we, we are. This is how we, we have this deep insight that, that nobody else in the world has ever seen, which is bullshit, but you know, that'll be the claim. And that'll, I, I, I could easily see something like that pop up and probably do really well because it, it's, uh, the, the completely open-ended nature of like paleo, it's cool in that I think it's intellectually honest. Like we have some starting places, then you kind of have to go in and start finding your way through it. But it, it's really hard for somebody who's just entering the scene brand new and they don't know anything. Like something like a Whole30 is, is handy in that it does have the lane lines. It's got this really tight structure and you do this, you don't do that. And for somebody that's coming from like, they have no idea what, like, does broccoli have protein or, you know, it's somebody that far out there. Um, I think that, that something like that is really helpful, but then people get through it. They start asking questions. The individual variation starts popping up and that's where people then start branching out and going to, I guess, more nuanced information sources and options and stuff like that. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that Dave also did a decent job about taking paleo and like bridging to keto and making the bulletproof diet the same thing you're talking about mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. like, hey, here's keto a keto version of paleo mm -hmm. pushed forward um i wonder if you know some like personal quantification like you said it's like very individual well you know like levels doing a good job with yep. dms i don't know if you played around much with that i know you've been yep. in space for a while but uh some sort of like biohacky quanti you know quantified self thing plus new like these other things in nutrition is like the next wave it's like that's uh, like a really popular thing moving forward too. Th that's a really good point and I, I i'm glad you mentioned it and I, I think that you're spot on like chris cresser and i were talking about that and um marrying some of this uh quantified self with uh different dietary approaches is probably the way that this is going to go yeah yeah it's a really you, good point have you been toying around with any of that stuff yourself lately I did. And I hate it. Like I'm, I, and this is like, it's such a huge opportunity, but it, it's, um, I wrote this piece, which I haven't been able to release yet. Uh, it, it's for one of these companies. And, um, the title is, uh, data is, uh, or testing is data. It's not the destination. And these guys are like, no, 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 no. We, we, we want testing to be the destination. I'm like, well, you should have thought that through before you brought me in as an advisor, because I don't, I don't agree with that. And I told you guys, I don't agree with that. So I think that these things are really valuable, but super quickly people do stupid things with it. Like, oh, you know, a 0.5 ketone is good. It's really easy to, to find, you know, people start getting into this kind of dick measuring contest with them. And it's like, well, if, if I just cut my protein in half and I eat a stick of butter at a time, then my ketones go to two. And so that's got to be better. And, you know, for different neurological conditions, for certain medical conditions, for adjunctive therapy with things like cancer and whatnot, that may be appropriate. But for 95, 99% of people, that's not really appropriate. And so, um, I dig the testing. So like we're, we're part of the healthy rebellion, we're, we're doing another reset. And right now we have the seven day carb test going. And I think it's really valuable for people to see what their personalized response is to different types of carbohydrate. 
But even then, like we have a ton of people they are like, should I do this thing? Like I've tried reintroducing carbs a bunch of times and I feel like hell. And, and I'm, so there's a bunch of people that feel like they should do it just because the carb testing seems kind of sexy and it's, it's neat and it is kind of cool. But people like me, like I know, like I just don't do that well with very many carbs. Like if my activity level is real high and I pick the right stuff and I time it, then I can kind of goose it up a little bit more, but I'm, uh, and again, like this is going to like, you know, sequester me into the spot where I'm, I'm like unfriendly and unusable to virtually everybody. But I, I really dig the testing, but I also think it can oftentimes end up being this distraction. Like um, Robert Piercig and the, the Zen, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance made this case that you, we go into science hoping that when we ask a question that it gets answered. But what happens when we get more information is that then you have, if you had one question to start off with, when you get more information, usually you have two to four questions mm. and it grows geometrically. The more information you have, usually your questions increase at a geometric rate. And so I, I find that to be really problematic for people. Like they just end up spiraling into, into the, this crazy land where they're constantly testing everything and they're not really like living in their body and I just really prefer things like, how do you look? How do you feel? How do you perform? If we want to do some biometric testing or like a CGM or something like that, that's great. But we need to really have a, a game plan for why we're doing it. Like, is it an accountability tool? Is it a little bit of insight? Because um, otherwise, I, I just find that people start doing kind of dumb stuff around it. And again, it... it it sucks because I could probably make a lot of money, like getting in and just like really, you know, promoting the pants off this stuff. But it, it, it honestly ends up creating even more work on the back end for me because people do silly things with it. And I've been in this odd spot where I'm, I'm trying to communicate that, yes, these are great tools, but they're not the, the in my opinion, the end all be all like, you know, they should be used for a purpose and the purpose could just be curiosity. That's fine. But um, for a lot of people that it, it's funny, it can actually get them into a lot of trouble because they, they start doing squirrely things to, to modify what those numbers are and not really understanding the bigger context. Yeah. I mean, I think that in general, people don't think about why they're doing something. And I would say people are doing these to try to seek optimal health. Mm -hmm. The question should be asked, okay, why, why don't you have optimal health? And I think the reason is, is because we fucked up all, all normal ecosystems. So we destroyed our food system and how we get food, like the ecosystem of like broadly speaking, and then also just the environment you live in. So even living in a house and doing all these things and having screens, all that type of stuff. Like we have, we don't have a normal human ecosystem anymore mm -hmm. and technology at large ruined all that. So I think that technology is great to then remove those problems. Like if we're using these things and getting data, it's great to you know quantify things on an individual basis. But the goal should be then to start removing these technologies and get you to a point where you're at a foundation where you're just like, oh, okay, this is what a human should be living like and get that feedback right. loop of, oh, maybe I shouldn't have this smart suites that breaks my CGM. Like maybe I shouldn't right. have these things. Like maybe I should go to bed earlier. Maybe I shouldn't be so, so stressed out. And then once you get those foundations, the, the goal shouldn't be to merge and be a cyborg and have infinite data. It should be to remove that and live more like how yeah. you should. In my, I mean, this is like sort of the idealist in me talking, but yeah. I and mean, then it's like the, the, where are you going and the, you know, why sort of questions aren't often asked with the data. Right. And, but I think they're like, I think they're phenomenal tools to speed up the feedback loop. Otherwise you eat a bagel you may feel like shit for the next, you know, couple hours or even in a few days. Like when I eat bread, I don't get, I get acne, but like three days later, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you eat it and you look at your Apple watch and it says, oh, hey, this, this thing is bad. And, and in the red zone, and you go, oh man, I shouldn't eat that. And that's right. why I think these things are really great. And because right. of so much individual variability. I mean, you, you did it in your in wired to eat around the carb test you're talking about that you do in your community, which is great to do as well. But I mean, if you don't have a meter, or CGM or even a finger prick one, you can kind of tell how you feel, but a lot of times people are so out of touch with how they actually, how their right. body heals that they have absolutely zero feedback loop. But yeah. yeah. Sl slippery slope for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I and I, uh, I, I may just be like kind of the prickly pseudo Luddite curmudgeon on this, you know, like I, I did some things like, uh, uh, HRV 
for, for a good period of time, but I just reached I think it really, you articulated it far better than I did, which is um, these things should be a tool to inform what you're up to, but there, there is, there's this diminishing return. And I think that that's where people don't understand it. And I wish that it was articulated a little bit better. And it's kind of hard for the people making these platforms to tell folks, Hey, this can be very valuable in the beginning and less valuable later on when you get your shit together. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough business model to, to, to couch that way. But um, like my HRV, uh, I just didn't know what else I would do to get better sleep. And I was like, God damn it. I feel pretty good. But the, you know, like it, it tells me that I'm only marginal. And, and uh, I, I started doing things like um, it would interpret my pre-bed reading as sleep latency. And so it would ding me for that. So then I would take my, my ring off, put it on the, the bed stand until I was ready to go to bed. Then I would put it on and then my sleep score was better. And then I was like, why, why am I doing this? I know I'm, I wake up and I feel good. I have good performance. If, if the girls wake up in the middle of the night with a nightmare, then my sleep sucked. And I know that because the next day is hell. <laughs> and, you know, So yeah. 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 I think that the good part is that we can make these decisions right now or where I think is going to be really interesting is when machines start making the decisions of, Oh, this is the data. I'm making a decision whether you're healthy or not and what you should be doing. Right. That right. Is right. I'm talking to um, someone who's doing a lot of work in healthcare right now and looking at how they're collecting information using machine learning to make decisions. And one of the examples he gave me was the psychology group who had tens of thousands of hours on people's voices um, doing calls, like um, remote therapy calls. Mm. They put that all into a machine learning database and it spit out, oh, it, uh, we can take six seconds and determine if somebody is depressed or suicidal or not. Wow. And so, well, yeah, you might have some, you know, confidence interval on that. What about the fringe people that aren't? And then you plant in their head and tell them the story is like, oh yes, you're, you're depressed and you're like, you're suicidal naive to go to this other thing. And it, I think that that's just one data point. But when you start getting that and you have copious amount of data from all these different sources, and you don't even, you don't even have any human intervention in saying like, yeah, here's what you should be doing with it. I think that that's where it gets really interesting. So we're right. gonna And dangerous. Here. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna have a weird yeah. chasm where the, w w I mean, with so many things, like we don't know what the logic is behind any machine learning algorithms. And we just like, okay, right. and the machines know better than we do. Um, so it'll be a, an interesting few years when I think when that stuff starts coming out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, and there's something too that I think that talking about like what's, what's next as far as public focus, it seems to be another one of these things where, where keto was sort of this natural, next point of paleo where people who are smart into this stuff just kept digging like trying to find more truths around it like why are people sick why are people unhealthy how can we figure it out uh and regenerative agriculture is i think a, another big thing where like mm -hmm. if you just keep digging it gets to food and how food is produced and how damaging it is for not only our health but the health of the planet and just like okay if we want to exist as a species and not too long we need to start addressing some of these issues um, and you guys obviously, were, you know, had Diana on last year to talk about sacred cow, but just curious as far as like how much of your time is spent thinking about that stuff now, um, in regenerative models and how, how that fits into the story for health. Man, that's, that's a, a tough one. And I'm, I'm, I'm people are gonna be like, wow, Rob's kind of a buzzkill today because I'm just like, this sucks. That's burning down, you know, uh, but, um, uh, if I could, that's where I would put all of my time and effort. Um, but it, it uh, uh, I think we were very fortunate for the timing of what we did with the film and movie. Like Diana wanted to, to do this 10 years ago. And I was like, nobody else cares. Like look, there's you and me, <laughs> Like we, we'll, we'll write this book, do this movie and we'll have two people consume it, you know? And it was like five years ago that I'm like, I think it's time by the time we get this done, like there'll, there'll be enough awareness that, that folks will be interested in it. But, um, it's a crazy time because, um, just regenerative ag itself is it, an assailable topic from so many different directions. And we, we, we looked at the health, the environmental and the ethical considerations of a meat inclusive food system. And, that very notion that meat may not be the, the number one concerning feature of climate change is super controversial and can get you canceled or banned or shadow banned. And we've experienced all of that stuff. Um, people that we try to support have experienced all that via, you know, social media platforms and whatnot. So 
it's getting ever more challenging to just get that message out. Um, now, it, interestingly, like COVID and climate change somewhere along the way got wedded together. You know, like Bill Gates just had this statement that, well, it's too bad uh, uh, COVID shut down the economy, but we didn't, uh, we didn't reduce carbon emissions enough. So we really need to double down on what we do next. And that, that's going to be on this like, you know, food production side and, and Bill Gates just became the largest owner of farmland in the, in the United States. And he's actually, some of the land that he's buying has historically been rangeland and he's going to try to convert it into farmland, which is a terrible idea on so many levels, but it all, um, it all caters to this narrative that, you know, meat is bad, meat's bad for your health. Um, you're a, a moral person to, consume it. And so it's, uh, uh, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit, um, I don't know if outright, maybe I need to, to call into this algorithm and find out in six seconds if I'm suicidal or depressed, but, um, uh, I'm not super optimistic, put it that way. Um, I think that there's so much money and the people are so verklempt with, with like this, this notion that like big tech is going to solve all of our problems and these like meat in a vat, you know, uh, impossible burger and everything. Um, it is so economically compelling to try to turn food into intellectual property and run it like a, a software company. Like there's so much money to be made there. There's just so much potential upside there. And Although, at least in the short term, I think it's going to be a boondoggle. I think it's going to be like Theranos. I think that it's going to be lies and deceit and the destruction of huge amounts of money. But these people have so much money that it, it almost doesn't matter whether they, they win or lose, you know. But in the process of doing that, um, it's going to both attack the regenerative agriculture perspective and also divert the potential away from, from investigating it. And I, I think that a really smart investment in regenerative agriculture processes could be something that, that could be a return on investment, very consistent for decades at a time. And I think that that's what everybody should really be excited about. And there was a time when that was more the way that financial systems work, but now it's just this kind of crazy speculative market driven by, by billionaires. So, um, I'm, I, I do think about it a lot, but, uh, it, it's kind of funny because Paleo and CrossFit and all these things that I, I've been involved with very early on, I feel like they really had some significant impact in the world. So I think I had a little bit of cocksureness around the ability to to take this idea that that you know maybe a few hundred, a few thousand people know about and get it out and you know reach kind of a global audience with it. But I'm um, I'm I'm a little less uh, uh, sure of the ability to really make this stuff stick. And, and, um, uh, I think that there's just a lot of, of, there's a ton of work to be done. It's very difficult to incentivize the work around this regenerative ag story. You know, it, it's, uh, it's not directly selling somebody abs or skinny jeans or a transformation story, you know, of, of weight loss or something like that. Like it's this just kind of long-term investment that that also you need a, a mini PhD to understand all of the different nuances in it, you know, whereas like this kind of plant based narrative, it's evil to kill animals, you shouldn't do it. Um, you can feed way more people not eating animals. And oh, by the way, uh, uh, doing away with animal husbandry will is the singular thing that we could do that's, that's going to mitigate or alter the course of climate change. All of those things I, I think are easily demonstrated to be wrong, but man, they're wonderful elevator pitches that are super sexy, really compelling. And, uh, and again, like it takes a lot of work to unpack any one of them to, to, to say nothing of all three of them. So again, like I, 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 uh, I'm not painting like the rosiest picture around that. I'm going to keep fighting in this space, but, um, I, I, uh, where, Five years ago, I thought that we might be able to really turn the corner on this and and make some powerful economic incentives for this whole process. I'm not sure if we will. And, and as I'm saying that, I'm, I'll, I'll actually say where I think that regenerative ag probably will take on. It's going to be in the developing world. 
um, the United States may be the last place on earth that develops or, or really embraces regenerative agriculture or kind of the more developed world. Um, developing countries cannot do the crazy things with, you know, printing money and they're kind of, you, you know, this kind of artificial monetary system that the United States has. And um, that is kind of the only quarter that there has been pushback towards the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, when they make recommendations that we need to uniformly do away with animal husbandry. There are a lot of uh, countries in developing worlds that have been like, we can't do that. Like huge swaths of our population rely on animal husbandry. We live in areas that are not amenable to agriculture the way that, you know, you guys are practicing it. And funny enough, we don't want to be completely dependent on the output of your row crop industrial food system. So we're going to maintain our food sovereignty. So interestingly, the, the, the one ray of hope that I do see is, is the developing world adopting, um, uh, what is effectively regenerative agriculture practices just because of the necessity. Like there is no other way to make that work either economically or ecologically. So I, I do actually have a significant amount of hope around it. It's just not for us. It's for everybody else really. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. challenging. It's, it's just crazy. You said that 10 years ago, you were chatting with Dan about this stuff. Like, yeah, not yet. I mean, I've been reading incessantly about this and like, Although Leopold and Wes Jackson and Wendell Berry and some of these guys have, have been talking about this stuff for 60 to 100 years. Right. right. Like, how did I not stumble upon this 15 years ago? Like, what? I mean, right. it's just, it's just wild. But I mean, the, the hope that I think is, you know, we have some of these massive companies who understand like, oh, we're not, we're not going to be able to make money the way we're making it in 50 years from now. Like we're not going to be a company because the world's going to be just chaos unless we invest in this because this is the future. So like, Nestle, Danone, General Mills, all these large companies are, you know, it's like they're starting to make significant investments in, in regenerative ag. Purdue bought this regenerative chicken farm operation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like there are companies that, that realize the case, but like you said, it's like, it, it's so difficult to think about how to compete with this vegan propaganda machine. It's just, you have Oatly and beyond and impossible who are able to raise such ungodly amounts of money to funnel that all into deceiving the public and having this massive marketing campaign to build these businesses that then go public, that then have an infinite funnel of capital to then grow again. And I would argue that if, if they didn't have all the sort of virtue signaling from billionaires pumping in, like, oh yeah, we have this cool, hot, new, like, you know, fake meat product that they wouldn't be able to be at the size they're at. Like their sales right. just don't support it. Like when Beyond Meat went public, it was, it was a terrible business and it right. still is. Like that... <laughs> the the way we finance businesses and the way businesses are able to get scale and traction is basically it's taken the the bay area sort of silicon valley a software approach of we'll just sell 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 make a shitty business and actually make money and then hopefully we'll get acquired or ipo one day and then that that's the whole point of it it's not to right. actually build a real business that provides any value to humanity right that's like going up against that in my mind is the is the absolute biggest struggle yeah. I mean, how do you compete against that? You know, there was this period of time where Theranos looked like it, it was going to make inroads into like LabCorp and Quest and stuff like that. Like it was a threat to those businesses and it wasn't a business. It was nothing. It was fucking smoke and mirrors. And it was so much hype and so much money pumped into it. that It was a, it was in a position to potentially nuke or damage these like keystone, you know, institutions in, in, you know, like our, our medical system. And then it turns out the, the CEO was a complete fraud and it was all lies and it was all propped up by, uh, you know, billionaire VC money. And I'm, I'm a huge free market type of type of person, but, um, that super speculative market, it, it's interesting. What it has become is, uh, a, a centralized command-based economy. It, ironically, you know, it's like there's these in, institutions are so insulated from reality that it doesn't, it's kind of like, well, we're just going to make uh, 
10 million or a hundred million pairs of these blue jeans and they're just the same size. And it doesn't really matter if anybody wants to buy them where our crazy billionaire backers are going to back it. And so there you go. <laughs> okay. So, and then anything else that would try to compete with that, there's no money, there's nothing, nothing gets funneled into it. And there's no, um, feedback loop around like, is this actually a viable business? Does it, does it make any type of sense at all? You know, so it's, that is going to be interesting and that's going to be a tough one to, to overcome. Yeah. I think a second one is the ethical concerns around it. And I think that you have people who are able to, you know, create this virtual mob and strike down businesses at will and cancel them in a, in a wave of their magic wand. And like, this is also the thing like, oh, you're killing animals. Killing is bad. You're a human. You don't want to be killed. Therefore, you, you can't do this. And we're all going to, you know, publicly shame you and make everybody else pull their support and rip the rug out underneath you. Like, is that going to happen to me? I mean, I already, you know, Kamala Harris and the campaign trail said, hey, we want to tax meat or whatever. I think it was a very brief thing. But I mean, we'll see if even if that gets considered. I mean, this, this administration is coming in tomorrow. Um, we'll see how much they sort of usher in this new era of people allowing themselves to, to sort of spread their opinions all over the place and not actually look at objective truth. Yeah. I mean, the world economic forum, like their, their great reset, and this isn't, this isn't conspiracy theory stuff. It's on the world economic forum website, you know, talking about, uh, how much animal husbandry must be eliminated to, to fight climate change. And when you really look at the numbers around that, there's, uh, there's so many other things you should look at other than that. And then when you consider the, the potential that this regenerative ag space, specifically around grazing animals, reversing desertification, improving carbon capture within soils, expanding the, the amount of soil that's, that's actually being utilized because you're converting desert back into arable grassland, it, it could be one of our more powerful tools, not just to feed people, but also as a, a climate change mitigating factor, because it, it decreases the severity of, of extreme weather events because you don't get massive amounts of erosion. It doesn't get as hot or as cold as quickly because of the, the kind of ecosystem that exists there. When you just have desert, it can get very hot or very cold very quickly because there's not a lot of water in the atmosphere. There's not a lot of life there. And, uh, properly managed holistically raised animals is arguably like our, our most powerful tool that we have in this story. And Alan Savory made the case that even if the greenhouse gas emissions from livestock are double or triple or quintuple what they are now, if you look at the potential of just reversing desertification, like in the, the sacred cow film, we highlight a rancher down in the Chihuahuan desert that's recovered a million acres of desert and converted it into grassland. And that could potentially be the totality of the Chihuahuan desert. That could be all of the great basin from like Reno to Salt Lake city to, to uh, uh, Las Vegas used to be grassland and, and, and people make, just ridiculous stories around like, well, that would be bad. More life would be bad. So we need to reduce the amount of life on the planet to protect life on the planet. Or it's just like, you're just like, fuck, I, I don't know what to do with this. You know? It's like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just goes into the fact that it's, it's not taboo to talk about facts and objective truths. Right. Right. And this is like, I mean, you've been in this space for a long time trying to dig and find these truths. I'm just like, your job's getting harder by the day. <laughs> it's getting more dangerous by the day too. You know, yeah. where, where do we go from here? Like how, like, how do we create, you know, all these people talk about safe spaces all the time. Like where's, where's the safe space to have discourse about objective truth? I don't know. I mean, we made the healthy rebellion and I've kind of abandoned, um, social media for the most part, like we post stuff. My assistant posts stuff. Cause I, I refuse to have any of the apps on my, my phone or anything. And because of uh, business obligations, I maintain a presence there. But um, I mean, is there going to come a day where us discussing, you know, these different nuanced topics, like does, does Mighty Networks, which is the, the outfit that hosts us, do they pull the, pull the plug on us and we're done? I, I, I don't know. Um, it, it's interesting, though, that I, it is fascinating to me that folks are such poor students of history that they 
they don't consider that even though they may feel like their current sociopolitical topic du jour that they're winning today, that that can't be turned and weaponized against them tomorrow. And this stuff, like um, anyone it, it can be, anyone can be in a spot where they, they turn around and they find that they are somehow like an oppressor of someone else, or they can be portrayed as, as such by someone somewhere, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's really hard to win that, that part of the virtue signaling Olympics. Like there's very few people who, who end up being like the most marginalized and the most oppressed. And then everybody else by extension then is kind of an evil person or we're all individuals and we should be met and treated as individuals and kind of assessed on that, that individual level. And we're part of a society. So we need to figure out how to make our, you know, our, our, our gears mesh in a way so that everything works. But it's, um, this is maybe part of the reason why I, I am in this, um, a little bit of a fugue over things, you know, like the regenerative ag, ag topic, the, the kind of broad censorship, the, the cancel culture, um, I see this stuff as so dangerous, like so, so incredibly dangerous. Um, I, I had the incredible opportunity to, to basically live with a, a family from Cambodia that escaped the Khmer Rouge um, during the worst part of that regime. Um, they lost family members trying to escape into Thailand and they just had horrific stories, but they talked about this society that everybody was largely culturally, ethnically, religiously the same. Like it, 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 you know, it's mainly a Buddhist country and everybody mainly had the same ethnicity. Some people had more Chinese ancestry. Other people had more Southeast Asian ancestry and people kind of, you know, geeked out on, on keeping track of that. Um, but by and large, people looked pretty much the same. There was largely the same language and uh, through identity politics, they were able to create divisiveness within that, that society that millions of people died and they murdered each other, you know? And so that was in a, a situation where everybody was largely the same religion, largely the same color, largely the same ethnicity, and with some, some goading on the part of some very unethical political figures and, and some, you know, kind of social e economic challenges, you're able to motivate people to murder one another. And then you look at the United States and it's like, you drive a couple of hundred miles and you're in a completely different, like socioeconomic, sociodemographic setting. Like if we get to the spot where we really start coming unraveled at the seams, it, it, it it's going to be a genie that you can't put back in that bottle. And I just, um, there's so many topics that are important. There's so many things that we need to address, but we kind of need to try to address them together. Just grinding people under boots because, you know, it, it because we, we, I don't, I don't agree with you on this. And so I'm going to go out and I'm going to do everything in my power to cancel you and cancel everything that you're about and make sure that you're, you're injured and damaged. Um, I, one, I don't think that's really fair to you. And two, I'm just amazed that people don't think that that could be turned around and weaponized against them. I, I, I'm just flabbergasted that they don't think that that could be spun around or that this, uh, this type of process could be, you know, misused. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of scared. Like I'm, I'm legitimately scared about that stuff. Yeah. yeah I think the, the frightening part is that we've had a lot of historical precedents that this direction goes south very quickly in zero historical precedents that this goes anywhere positive. Right. Uh, and it, it makes right. me sort of like nervous to become a productive farmer. Those are, yeah. those are the first folks to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How do we keep that private? Um, cool. Well, don't disappear yet, Rob. We, we need you. <laughs> <laughs> well, same for you. I mean, it, it uh, uh, you know, what's funny though, I, I, uh, I'm part of a couple of different business groups and there was a really, really smart young guy in this group, serial entrepreneur. He's in finance. I mean, he's just brilliant. And he's been very, very economically successful at a, at a young age. But um, the, this, he, he did a, a really valuable online presentation, just talk, talked about a bunch of different stuff, tax stuff and business stuff and everything. But then it was kind of opened up and people in the community started asking him questions and they were like, so 
where do you see this current environment going? You know, it, all of it, like the, the kind of uh, encroachment of government, the uh, looking at taxes, um, the, the divisiveness within, you know, just culture and online and all this stuff. And he was like, you know, I am an entrepreneur to my, to my core. And he said, I think that within 10 years, I, I would find the risk profile of starting any type of a new business to be so monumental that I wouldn't do it. And that is one of the, and, and I want people to stew, stew on that. Like if they take anything out of this thing, um, I really think that that might be the most important thing to all of this. And they may be like, well, what does it matter? You know, this guy, you know, he starts the entrepreneur, the person who just comes up with a new idea and sticks a flag in the ground and does something around that is such a unique feature of kind of Western liberal democracies. Like it is so unique. It is so powerful. It, it, it enriches so many people. Like it really is this, this amazing way of lifting a ton of people up out of poverty and destitution and, and all kinds of things like that. And this guy to say that he can see an aperture closing where in 10 years he would find it too risky, not worth it to try to do new business endeavors. Folks should find that terrifying and, and they should then retro engineer what it is that would take somebody who is so good at this. This is like somebody who, who is like a savant at, tennis or, or basketball or something. And like, yeah, I mean the, the, the culture around the NBA or the co culture around the, uh, uh, you know, um, professional tennis is so becoming so toxic and so broken that I, even though I'm, I'm arguably one of the best people in the world at doing that, I don't think it would be worth it for me to invest my life in that. Like that, that has been one of the biggest kind of wake up calls for me in the the last five or 10 years. Like I, I was just kind of yeah. dumbfounded. And after he said this, this group, there, there were probably hundred, 150 people on the Zoom call. It was like a minute of dead silence. And he was like, did I say something wrong? And the guy interviewing him was like, I think everybody just pooped their pants, you know, was basically what, what he said because everybody got it. You know, this was a group of entrepreneurs and hard chargers and, and, the, but this, this guy, it's a group of people that are good at what they do. And this guy is, so much better than everybody else on that call. Like he is the guy that we all listen to when he does his stuff. And again, young guy, like late twenties, like so fucking good at what he does. So inspiring at what he does and him. Like I've got an expiration date on this. I don't know. He said, I, I'm probably going to start farming when I'm done with this, you know? So yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. Know. it's not just like these people who start businesses are in it for the billions of dollars that they make every second or whatever. You know. They love doing it. They can't imagine anything else. It's like somebody who just can't imagine doing anything other than like concert piano or, or flower arranging or whatever it is they're passionate about. They love building businesses and yeah, getting paid well is great, but they, you could lock the guy in a, a cave in Siberia and he would figure out how to make a business. Mm. And he's like, I think it's too risky now. It's wild. It's fucking crazy. Yeah. Well, we'll leave people on that note to, to <laughs> so they can see you on that <laughs> the rest of the day. Um, where can people find your stuff? I want to highlight um, as well your community, which I joined last year. I've been very silent in there, but it means like such a positive and encouraging environment and the opposite of everything we were just talking about where people are just genuinely trying to help each other. And it's it's been amazing to see you build that thing. So huge hat tip to that. Where can people find that? It's uh, the Healthy Rebellion, join.thehealthyrebellion.com. And my wife and I do a weekly podcast, same title, The Healthy Rebellion. And that's pretty much where I do the bulk of my stuff. Like I throw some stuff onto social media, but I don't really curate or interact on there at all. So if you want to track me down, um, you can shoot a, a, a question request to the podcast or you can track me down on The Healthy Rebellion. And also drink LMNT. Drink L element. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of work over there with the, with the element folks trying to pimp hydration. So yeah, that's definitely, a, I, I am spending more and more time over on our, our blog with, with that and um, uh, really enjoying that. That's been a fun group of people to work with. Cool. Well, thanks Rob. Appreciate it. Doc, thank you. Thanks for all the work you do. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Natural State Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, I'd really appreciate 
you heading over to whatever service you're listening to this podcast on, dropping me a five-star review and your thoughts on the show. This helps us get discovered by more people and spreading the good gospel of health. And if you want to stay plugged into all of my self-health experiments, recent research in books that I'm reading and my interpretations of those things, products that I'm testing and thoughts on all things related to health, check out my free weekly newsletter called The Feed. You can sign up for that at dranthonygustin.com slash the feed. That's dranthonygustin.com slash the feed. Thanks again for tuning in and your support of the Natural State Podcast.